All right, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. I want everyone, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes. Okay? Don't, don't fall asleep there. Okay, so I want you to imagine your first job. Your first day at your first job. Why did you get it? Did you want to save up for a car? Did you want to impress someone? Did you want to finally have independence? Did you want to prove your worth to yourself? Think about that, that job, that first day on that job. Or maybe the first time you had chores that you had to do. So get that in your mind. Get that, get that feeling of, of what that day was like. Now, imagine that you showed up for that first day and you decided, I'm not going to do anything. You just said, decided before, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to sit down somewhere and just rest all day. Think about the boss that you had, how they would feel about that. Think about how the coworkers would feel. Kind of weird, right? Okay, everyone can open their eyes. What was it like going back there? Was it exciting? So first jobs are pretty exciting. I remember my first job, I was a waiter at uh, Perkins Family Restaurant. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but I basically like gave people pies and breakfast and stuff, but I got tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, well, I got tips from some of you guys in like change and nickels and stuff. But that first job is exciting. In fact, any new job uh, can be pretty exciting. You think about, okay, what's my new title? What, what are my new responsibilities? What do I get to do? What are the benefits? What's the pay? What could I, what does this job mean for my career? And you go into it thinking these things, and no one goes into these jobs thinking, I'm going to go and I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to show up and just sit there. No one has that, maybe, well, maybe millennials have that mindset. You know, we've heard the stories and everything, but other than that, no one has that mindset. In our passage today, James is going to warn us that we could actually have our faith be like that. That that's something that Christians can fall into, that trap of being excited about, you know, God, believing in Jesus, but just show up and do nothing and, and have it be pretty meaningless. So that's kind of what we're talking about tonight. And you'll find our passage in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. So you can open it up if you want. I'll have it up here on the, on the uh, screens for you. If you want to follow along or you can grab that Bible, get out your Bible. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Many of you have probably heard parts of our passage tonight. It's a pretty famous passage, probably the most famous passage in James. And uh, we're going to go through it and, and let him teach us and soak in what, what God has to teach us through this amazing passage. Verse 14, it starts... What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? You can tell James is, is now kind of moved into a dialogue. He wants to talk to us. He wants to have a conversation. And he wouldn't be asking this question if this wasn't a problem in his church. So it's not a hypothetical situation. It seems that there were people in his church thinking, all I have to do is believe in Jesus, and I'm good. I can sit back. I can live my life just like everyone else. That's all I need, just faith. But James says, what, what use is that? Can that faith save him? And notice, he says, if someone says he has faith. So he's already tipping his hand to us that maybe this isn't a real faith, an alive faith, a saving faith that he's talking about. Because it's someone says he has faith, but he has no works. And vocabulary you're going to see throughout these, these verses. Vocabulary is very important to point out exactly what these certain words and phrases mean, because as we're going to see, you see them elsewhere in Scripture, and they could mean something else. So when James says works here, when someone says he has faith, but he has no works, we're going to talk a lot about that word works. What does works mean? What is James talking about? What is Paul talking about when we get to him? 
And I'll give you a sneak preview. Works is all the stuff we've been talking about in James. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Helping, showing no favoritism, helping those in need. Acts of love, acts of mercy. These are things that are works. But we'll get there. We'll get there. And notice he also says, can that faith save him? So the, the that is very important as well because it's showing that he's talking about if someone says he has faith. So the faith that the person is talking about, can that faith with no works save him? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And this brings us back, this, this scenario that he's setting up brings us back to the true religion that we heard at the end of chapter 1. It brings us back to showing no favoritism. It brings us back to, to helping a brother or sister in need. We've seen these themes before. It's the same thing. What do you hear when you hear if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food? My mind goes to daily bread that Jesus talks about in the, the Lord's Prayer. He says, give us today our daily bread. So Jesus t- teaches us to, to pray and ask God for our daily sustenance. Well, what if our brother and sister doesn't have that? It seems what James is saying, that God's method of meeting that need, of answering that prayer, because this person without uh, clothing and in need of daily food, certainly they're praying the Lord's Prayer like Jesus asked them to. And James is saying, we are the instrument that God uses to meet that need, to meet that prayer. God's way of fulfilling it is through his people as they share with those in need, his people. So this proves more shocking when the person tells him, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, yet does nothing. Because God is actually using us to answer prayer in each other's lives, and when we don't do that, we're actually inhibiting God's work among others. And this phrase, go in peace, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. It's basically, I don't want to hear it, get out of here. It's a, it's a pretty standard way that they, the, the words here is a pretty standard way that they ended conversations in kind of the, the Greco-Roman world. Go in peace. It, he, he pronounces an empty blessing and he ends it there. Be warmed and be filled. I'm, I'm not going to do it, but someone will take care of you. Just go and, and good luck to you. That's basically what this person's saying. And if you think about it, this person, I don't know, I'd argue this person's worse than our two guys in the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, the, the Levite, the priest. This person understand, fully understands the need and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a brother or sister in Christ and they are need there. This person fully understands and still says, no go, you're good. Someone will take care of you. I'll pray for you. Go in peace. How many, of us, how many of us have heard, I'll pray for you, right? And do, do we actually pray? Do, does that person actually pray? And is, is that all? You know, some people need more than I'll pray for you. Prayer is so important and prayer is so powerful. But as I said, God uses us to answer prayer, right? So when we, say, when we just say, I'll, okay, I'll pray for you, but that's messy. I don't want to deal with it. I promise, I'll pray for you. Go be warmed, be filled. I feel like we can be guilty of that. I can be guilty of that. I mean, this is convicting for me. God uses us to provide, so we must step up to the plate. That's what James is saying. He's saying, well, what if this happens? What use is that? The answer is expecting it's no use. It's no use if I tell someone that. It's not going to help them. It's not going to answer their prayer. And it's the same thing with faith with no works. He says it's, it's useless. There's no use in that. And what, you know, the, we, ha- we do have people that are without clothing and in need of daily food, certainly, and, and we need to be there for those people. We need to 
to help those people, but what other, what other ways are people suffering? In our church, he says brother and, or sister. He's talking about believers. Do you know people in church that are, that are hurting, that are suffering? Not even just financially. Spiritually, they're, they're struggling in their marriage. They're struggling in parenting. It's tough. You guys know it's tough. They're struggling with some loss, some health thing, and all they need is someone to come alongside them and show them mercy, show them grace, show them care, show them love. Let's not just say, go on your way, be warm to be filled. Let's step up to the plate and show our faith by our works. And one last thing about this, James' example shows the need for community. I, I, I can't help a brother or sister in need if I don't have a brother or sister, right? So if I just go to church and it's like a concert and I go, enjoy, raise my hands, praise, again, not a bad thing, a wonderful thing. But if I do that and then I just go home and that's church, I don't even have a brother or sister. I don't have any relationships. I don't know of people's need, so I can't be there for them. I can't live by the law of Christ that we talked about last week that James is calling us to do. What is the prophet? The prophet is nothing. So he says in the same way. Just like that phrase is useless to that person, in the same way faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And again, we'll talk about the works part in way more detail later. But James is using strong language here. He's not, he's not kind of nudging us, right? He's saying it's dead. It's not much stronger language than that, than this faith is dead. And why does he say this? Well, this is our, I'm going to refer to our first passage from the Apostle Paul's writings, but we're going to get to a lot of them. But 2 Corinthians 5.17, I was telling my wife a couple days ago as I was doing this, I feel like 2 Corinthians 5.17 applies to every single passage in the Bible. Every single sermon I preach, I feel like I could put up this passage. But, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. New creation. That means dead to life. I was dead. My old person, all I could do was sin. I was destined to for eternal punishment, but God remade me. He remade me, and I'm new. I'm living. I have life. So that's why faith without works is dead, because a new creation isn't just stagnant. I'm not created new, and I'm a new person, and then I'm just kind of the same person. I can't, my life doesn't look any different. Sure, my intellectually, yeah, I believe these things. Of course I do, but I'm not really a new person. I look the same. I sound the same. I do the same things. That's not a new creation. And that's what James is talking about. Faith without works is dead, being by itself. Because there's no evidence of a new creation. There's none. Nothing like that. I think one of the most disheartening moments as a Christian is when you're somewhere and you know there's allegedly other Christians around. Maybe you're even in a church or something, or I don't know, but, and you look around, and you realize these people don't look different from the world. This could be a Saturday night at, you know, some, I don't know, Billy Joel, I don't know what music you guys listen to, but some concert. You know, I look around, and, I've, and, I, and I know about a lot of these people's lives that they're not that much different than if they didn't know Christ. One of my wife's hard, the, one of the hardest things in her job is she works at a, at a school and some of the staff say they're Christians. Some of the staff, you know, go to church, whatever, but she always talks about how they, do the, they talk the same way. They do the same things. They go out and, do, and, and have the same, you know, fun that the other staff does. They don't look any different at all. That's dead faith. They, they may use different words, we may use different words, but ultimately we haven't changed. We're not a new creation. Our faith is dead. Man, how many Christians are, are happy to live comfortable lives, 
especially here in the Western world, in America, in Arizona, how easy is it to just sit back and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Sure, I'll go to church. I'll listen to the message. But I'm going to live my life how I want to live it. Right? I live in Arizona. I'm free. I'm just going to sit back and watch what I want to watch, talk how I want to talk. My faith doesn't really make a difference in my life. Sure, I believe it, but, you know, I can sit back and, and that'll co- My faith will come in handy in the end times when the judgment comes. Then I'll, you know, get out. For, I'll reach deep into my pocket and get out my belief and say, I got it. I'm good. James is telling us that's not really going to work. That's not how it works. I don't know if any of you watch basketball, NBA. I'm a big NBA fan. I could just watch basketball. Yes, right here. Perfect. Do you know who Ben Simmons is? Not really. Okay, fair enough. He plays on Brooklyn. Well, he doesn't play. He, he's on Brooklyn. But anyway, Ben Simmons is this he, uh, player that was, I think he was the first pick in the NBA draft. He was a great player in college. Pick, uh, he, he went into the draft right after his freshman year. Uh, super tall point guard. He can dribble like the best point guards, and, and he's a really good player. He got to the league, and something clicked where he just decided, I don't want to play. I, he, he claims uh, some, there's controversy involving, he claims like mental illness, he claims injuries when he doesn't really have, he won't let the team doctors look at him. He's just this player that is really good, but he doesn't play when he actually gets into the game and gets on a team. And he was traded a, a couple times, and, and he's just kind of now universally known as kind of a useless asset to a basketball team. He's on the Brooklyn Nets right now. But that's kind of what, he, what James is talking about, just sitting on the sidelines. I'm sure he loves saying, yeah, I'm an NBA player. I'm starting point guard of the Brooklyn Nets. I, I love all the money. I love all the fame. I love all the whatever, whatever, whatever. But he doesn't do anything, and it's just going to fall away, and, and it's just going to be dead. That's what James is talking about. We can say, we can love the idea of being a Christian. We can say that we believe, but does it change us? Do, do we get into the game? We can just sit back and watch. Or do we, do, do we act? Do we show those acts of mercy and acts of love and help people? We don't want to just be in a, a Sunday social club, as Dr. Ball would say. We want to be in a body of believers that loves each other and helps each other and works out our faith. So we go on in verse 18. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Is anyone confused by that? Yeah, Anthony raised his hand quickly. That's good. So here's a translation that I think is a little bit more helpful. Because there's scholarly debate, as there is about everything in the Bible, but there's scholarly debate as to who's talking here, what they're saying, when it ends, when James begins, and and all this. I think it makes the most sense when you just think of James talking to this hypothetical person and saying, but someone may well say that you, so the person is now saying, Or James is saying, someone may well say that you have faith and I, James, have works. So the person is dividing faith and works and saying, oh, I have faith by itself and that's good. All I need is faith. I don't don't need the works. Show me your faith without the works. And and so then James is saying, show me, James, your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll show you that my faith is real, that my faith is genuine. So this person is saying, I don't need the works. And James is saying, well, you'll see how important the works are when you look at my faith. Because your faith is dead. Your faith is empty. So to James, in a sense, works are evidence of true faith. Works are evidence of true faith. I'll show you by my faith by my works. But... In a couple verses, we'll see they're actually more than that. Works aren't just evidence of our faith. They are that, but they're something a little bit more as well. And then we get this talk about the demons. This is interesting. He says, you believe that God is one. So he's talking to this potential person that has this this faith without works. You believe that God is one. 
you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. We don't think like this. We don't realize all the knowledge that demons actually have. He says, you do well. He he could be being ironic, uh, or at the least he's showing this is important, that they believe that, but it's not enough, right? Demons aren't saved. Demons don't have real faith. We could hear James saying, you believe in the Trinity. You do well. You believe in the inerrance and authority of Scripture. You do well. You believe in water baptism by submersion. You do well. You believe in pre-trib, pre-millennial eschatology. You do well, he could say. You believe homosexuality is a sinful lifestyle. You do well. You believe in voting conservative. You do well. You can hear James saying these, these things. But the demons also believe, and they shudder. I can do all those things. Demons, evidently, have better theology, have better knowledge of spiritual reality than me, than Pastor Anthony, than Pastor Roger, than Dr. Wayne Grudem. Demons know the reality, and they shudder. And that word shudder is like uncontrollable trembling. I just brought my kids to the pediatrician for their yearly checkup. My five-year-old had to get three shots. Do you think he was shuddering, trembling? It immediately made me think of that because I had to literally lay on top of him as he's screaming in my ear while the lady put the shots in his legs. And the demons are a million times more than that. They, they know these things, but it doesn't change their behavior. These demons are out here wrecking the whole world. But they have better theology than than me, than all of us. Because it doesn't mean it. It doesn't change their behavior. It doesn't change their actions. It doesn't bring about any works, any mercy, any love, any grace. Their knowledge does not change their behavior. And that's why he points out these demons. But are you willing to acknowledge, he goes on to say, You foolish person, that faith without works is useless. So now he's called this person out. He calls him a foolish person. This word is like hollow. Like your knowledge is a hollow knowledge and it gives you hollow morals. And he says faith without works is useless. So we've heard faith without works is dead. Faith without works is now useless. And works, the the word useless actually is the word work. Just workless. So literally it says that faith without works is workless. Meaning faith without works doesn't work. It won't change you. It won't bring you closer to Christ. It won't save you. Faith without works does not work. It's workless. So we go from this negative example of the demons showing us that, man, this faith without works is useless, is workless, And now we're going to go to to an example, a a positive example of faith and works working together. So verse 21, was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now this is interesting because Paul says this in Romans 4, 2-3, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So this is Paul's way of saying nothing that Abraham did justified him. Nothing that Abraham did made him righteous with God. But again, what does the word works mean to Paul? And what does the word works mean to James? And we'll get to that, but what I want to focus on here is justified justified, these, these apostles seem to have something a little bit different in their minds when they say justified. We know what Paul means by justified. He means legal standing before God. God at the moment, I put my faith in Christ. God declares me to be righteous if that faith is genuine and shown by works, but we won't go there. But Paul's justified is that moment when I'm declared righteous by God. It's a, it's a legal term. 
In James, it's more kind of the whole process. Putting my faith in it, living it, dying and glorification. That's justification to James. That's save. Remember he said, can that faith save him? That's salvation to James. It's beginning and it's end result. So when James says, our father Abraham was justified by works, it means the works worked with his faith and showed him to be justified and actually matured or completed his faith. And we'll see that in a moment here. Because James says, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. As a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Same scripture. But James is pointing out that because of the works, the faith was uh, perfected, and Abraham was uh, credited, he was credited to him as righteous, and he was called a friend of God. So not only did Abraham's work show his faith as genuine, but his obedience somehow matured or completed his faith. Remember that word from uh, the very beginning of chapter 1, the very beginning of this book. Uh, it said, the, you let the um, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because uh, they'll develop you and you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Same word. So it seems as just, the, just as the trials and, and considering them joy and, and that kind of refines and, and builds our, our relationship with Christ, works refines and builds our faith. Faith was perfected. Faith was completed. And I was thinking of it maybe like an acorn. You know, an acorn is, is an oak tree. Did you know that? An acorn is an oak tree just in a different stage of development. And if you are a uh, pro-life warrior, you know kind of some of those arguments. But it's an oak tree in just a different stage of development. But without water, soil, nutrients, it's never going to get there, is it? It's just going to rot and die. And, and the, the mature oak tree will never come about. It won't become what it's meant to be. Same with faith. Works are the stuff that grows our faith into maturity. The acorn is still the oak. The, the, the profession, the, the faith is still faith, but the works in some mysterious way seem to grow it and bring that faith into completion, into perfection. Abraham's faith, it seems, as James says, was not complete until he acted on it. His faith was not complete until he actually acted on it. And James points out him offering up his son Isaac. This is, to me, this is the most controversial part, that it's not just that works show our faith to be genuine, but works complete, perfect. In some way, they work together to bring us to where God wants us to be. Just like, just like all that stuff brings that acorn to fruition, works, mercy, love, grace, helpfulness, those things bring our faith along. And it says the scripture was fulfilled and Abraham believed God. So when Abraham offered Isaac, he was fulfilling the fact that he was justified when he put his faith in God, in the Lord. So his works fulfilled, not only showed, but fulfilled and matured and completed his faith. And, he, and he's called the friend of God because what did God do? God said, I, I have such a relationship with Abraham that I'm not going to withhold my plan about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's faith in action brought him to such a place with God where God considered him a friend and actually told him about what he was going to do and, and talked to Abraham about it and had that dialogue that we know about. And here's, here's the proof again. Genesis 22, 12. He said, God said to Abraham, right as he had that knife up, he's ready to sacrifice his son. Do not reach out your hand against the boy and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Because his faith showed action, because his faith 
changed him and made him do something so unthinkable, but God told him to do it. Now God knows that his fear was real. And fear is, another, is an Old Testament word for faith, right? God knows that his faith is real because of his action, because of his work. James goes on to say, you see, that a, you see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. There we have it. And now it gets a little dicey. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. What does Paul say in Romans 3, 28? For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works. Is that it? Apart from works of the law, right? Hmm, that's interesting. But yeah, Paul says a person is justified by faith apart from works. James says you see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. Augustine put it this way. Paul said, Paul said that a man is justified through faith without works of the law, but not without those works which James speaks. And then Calvin says, salvation is by faith alone, but by a faith that is not alone. Salvation is by faith alone, but by a faith that is not alone. So let's look at, we're going to look at two words quickly, how James uses them and how Paul uses them. So the Apostle Paul, works, when you hear works, most of the time in the Apostle Paul's writings in Scripture, in the New Testament, it's works of the law. Circumcision, Sabbath, uh, abstaining from, from foods that will make me unclean. Kind of the Old Testament law, those works of the law, those are the things that Paul's talking about. Because those are things that were good, but people corrupted them and they became boastful. How well can I follow the Old Testament law? The Pharisees, we see them clashing with Jesus because they have all these rules that they follow and they, they're so righteous. It's boastful, these works. It's attempting to place God under an obligation. You said if I do this, 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 and this, then I'm good. Then I'll be in paradise. Then I'll be your, your child if I do all these things. It's attempting to place God under an obligation to save me. And it's, an, it's ultimately an attempt to earn salvation. That's what Paul's talking about. These works, these kind of empty works that, that I do to try and earn salvation. I, I, I'm trying to work for it. It's not a free gift anymore. And it's selfish. Ultimately, it's selfish. It's about me. It's about my, my cleanliness. It's about me and you know, earning how, how much good kind of empty works that I can do. It's selfish. Whereas the Apostle James, when he says works, they're works of love. They're the things that we've been talking about. Obedience to the law of Christ. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's obedient. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. It's being obedient to Christ, to our Lord, doing what he asked us to do, following the law of Christ. Like I said, it's a result of our salvation. We're not trying to earn anything. It's because of our salvation. It's because Jesus died on the cross for us. God himself died on the cross for us. Now, because of that, we're, we can't help but do these works of love and of generosity and of mercy. And the works the Apostle James talks about are selfless. So he says faith, people are justified by faith alongside works. Apostle Paul says faith apart from works because these are the two works that they're talking about. Now let's talk about faith. What do they mean when they say faith? Well, the Apostle Paul is talking about new creation. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17? The old has gone, the new has come. Behold, I am a new creation. When I put my faith in Christ, I am a new creation. The Apostle Paul talks faith in. I put my faith in Christ. It's like a chair. I believe the chair can hold my weight, but until I sit in the chair... I haven't really put my faith in it. I, I, I give Christ my life. I trust in him to save me. Faith is relational to Paul. It's a relationship with God. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's dynamic. It's powerful. It changes lives. It changes the world. And it justifies. It justifies. It, it brings me into a right relationship with God and 
and he declares me righteous because of the faith that Paul talks about. Now, the faith that the Apostle James is talking about is alone. Faith alone, without anything else. It's, it's belief. It's faith about. Not faith in. It's just looking at the chair and saying, yeah, I think that'll, I think that'll hold my weight. Cool. Just walk away, right? It's faith about. It's knowledge. Intellectual knowledge about something. Ultimately, it's dead. He says, the faith without works is dead. That's the faith that the person claims they have at the beginning of this passage. It's useless. We've seen this. Useless, workless. That's the faith Paul's talk, or James is talking about, and it cannot save. For all those reasons, it's dead. It's useless. It's meaningless. What about other New Testament? What about other people in the New Testament, New Testament writers? Do they agree with this? Would they say, yes, your faith needs to result in some kind of changed life and some kind of works, or it's not really faith at all? Well, we'll start with John the Baptist. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. So he says, repent, have faith, put your faith in, in, in God, in the Lord, in Christ, and produce fruit that's consistent with that repentance. If you actually repent, you will produce fruit. Ooh, I didn't give you a 18 through something. It's a mystery. Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can it, uh, did I say Matthew? Jesus says this. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruits is what? cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. You will know people who are actually following me, people who have faith in me, people who have a relationship with me by their fruits. But he, he goes on to say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Jesus agreed. He says your faith will result in action or it's not really faith at all. By, your, by their fruits, you will recognize them. The Apostle John says in, in, in his uh, letter, 1 John 3, but whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, that sounds familiar. Sounds like what James was just talking about. How does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue. Let's not just say we have faith, but in deed and truth. A couple weeks ago, you heard James talk about being doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Same thing John is talking about. Same thing he's talking about today. Works alongside faith, perfecting faith. Let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And then even Paul, even the Apostle Paul, Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, so the works of the law don't mean anything, but faith working through love. That's what's meaningful. That's what God is calling us to. Faith working through love. James would call that faith with works. Faith alongside works. They all agree, even Paul. And then remember the famous love passage, right? He starts it off, And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, and I would argue that love is action, right? It's not just a feeling I have for people. It's acting and loving them. I am nothing. And then he, at the end he says, But now faith, hope, and love remains, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Not the greatest of these is theology. Not the, important, right? Those three remain. It's important. Not the greatest of these is, is what I believe. The greatest of these is love because that proves what I believe is true. What I believe is right. That my belief is in the right person because I can love. And I have these acts of love. Okay, let's real quick get to Rahab. In the same way. So we had Abraham and now we have Rahab. Very different examples. In the same way was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works also when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. We find this story in Joshua chapter 2. 
And it says, uh, one, in verse 11, it says, when we heard these reports, so she's, Rahab is talking to the spies. When we heard these reports, our hearts melted and no courage remained in anyone any longer because of you. And then what does she say? For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven, above and on earth below. That sounds like a profession of faith to me. Faith results in works. Faith results in works. So we have this kind of spectrum, it seems, that James is building for us. We have Abraham, wealthy, moral, father of Israel, kingly figure. That's Abraham. That describes Abraham. So he's on one end, about as good as it gets, according to Scripture. And then we have Rahab on the other hand. She's a prostitute. She's probably poor, right? She's immoral. She's a, I mean, she's a prostitute. She's an outcast among the Canaanites. Again, she's a prostitute, outcast. Even among the Canaanites, not even among Israel, but among the, the wicked Canaanites. And she's a minor figure in her society, kind of a throwaway figure. But both of these, Abraham and Rahab, showed their faith to be genuine and allowed their faith to bring about good works that Paul is talking about. So what, Paul, what, or what James is talking about, what James is doing is he's building this, this spectrum. Abraham on one end, Rahab on the other end, and, and he's saying that everyone in between it applies to as well. It's not just Abraham that showed his faith by his works, not just Rahab, but everything in between. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm better than Abraham, wealthier, father of Israel, all that. You may be. Fred may be. That might be true. But the rest of us, I don't think we're better than Abraham, Probably we're not worse off than Rahab. She was in a pretty, pretty bad place in life. We're somewhere in between, but it doesn't matter. If we're Abraham or we're Rahab, our faith has to produce works. That's what James is telling us. Our faith has to produce works because it did for them, and they are our example, and now it needs to for us. And we can be the example to others. We can be just like Abraham. We can be just like Rahab. They can look at us they can say, oh, Tom, every Sunday he's in there putting away tables, putting away chairs. He's not just sitting on the sidelines. I know many of us can't and, and, you know, don't go to lunch and all that, but I see that. We see that. That's an example of faith with works. Paulina stepped up to, and Joy, stepped up to lead the cafe. Wow, that's quite a... That's quite an example of, of meeting a need. People, people, let's be honest, people need their coffee. That is a desperate need of people. So, so she's stepping into that. We can be the example and show others what it's like to have a faith that works. A faith that works. Last verse. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also what? Faith without works, Sarvia, right, is dead. I heard you talking. Faith without works is dead. I was thinking about a good example of this. Who knows this guy? Some of you might have even seen this movie in the theater. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't actually know how old this movie is. But who is this? Is this, what part of the movie is this, Pinocchio? What do, what do you think? Yeah, the very beginning, right? He's still just a lifeless puppet. You can see kind of the empty glaze in his eyes, and he's still got his strings. This is faith without works. He says faith without works is dead. This is just a dead puppet. He, he, he's just lifeless. He just stares. Doesn't do anything. He's still got strings, so he doesn't have any control or anything. Who is this? It's Pinocchio. It's Pinocchio. At the end of the movie, after they've gone through all their thing, eaten by the whale, all that stuff, and, and Geppetto's wish is granted, and Pinocchio becomes a real boy. This is faith with works. This is alive. You can see the life in his eyes now. You can see the rosiness in his cheeks. There's life there. He's like, hey, it's a me, Pinocchio. That was terrible. But you can see the life, right? 
Faith without works. True, genuine faith that shows itself through works. That works, perfects, and matures. Can, still connected to sin. Still connected to death. Still moved around by the world. And the world dictates what it does. Now I'm free. My chains are gone, right? The song goes. I'm now free to live for Christ and to live for love and to live for all the things that we've been talking about. Faith without works is dead. Faith that does not reveal itself in works in a changed lifestyle that glorifies God and seeks his heart for the world is not faith at all. It's only a shell or a corpse of faith. So do you want to be do you want to be dead? Do you want your faith to be like, be like this? And this is like a nice little drawing, right? He's talking about like a corpse. Do you want that to be your faith? Or do you want to be alive? Do you want to be serving people? Do you want to be helping people? Do you want to be showing love to people? Do you want to identify people in church that need some help and step up and help? Do you want to look at at the world around you, your circle of influence, and say, oh, I'm alive. I have a faith that works. I'm going to help. I'm going to step up. I'm going to be the example. Do you want a faith that is dead or a faith that is alive? It's a question we all can ask ourselves. Let's be the example. Let's show the world that, that we believe in Jesus by our works. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for your word and for inspiring and, and superintending James, the apostle, to, to write this book and this passage to clarify what exactly faith is. That it's not just, yeah, I agree that that's true. But it's, yes, I agree that that's true and I'll never be the same. And I'm a new creation. And I'm going to love my neighbor as you loved me. Thank you that you clarify through that, that for us through your word. And, and may you empower all of us through your spirit to be the example, just like Abraham, just like Rahab, to those around us, how to love, how to have mercy, how to help people, how to show grace to people. May we have faith that works and not faith that's dead, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.